So hello everybody. I, f I feel looking out here like I know kind of half the audience. I didn't know I knew that many people. Um, it's really good to see you all here, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm uh, sure you've had a full day. It's the first day of CTAC, so a full day full of uh, talking and thinking about science. So I invite you to sit back in your chairs, relax a bit for what I'm hoping is a gentle but uh, informative introduction to the myths and me mechanisms of epigenetic inheritance. So these are my kids, uh, <laughs> they're in disguise. And uh, I think we can all agree in this room that they are who they are in large part because of the 3.2 billion nucleotides of DNA organized into 20,000 genes that are found in all of their cells. These genes contribute everything from their hair color to their eye color, to their personality to some degree, to their susceptibility to disease. So this is their genetic inheritance, and uh, it's passed on through the generations. From here you have the great-grandparents, to the grandparents, to the parents, to my sons. Uh, more or less undisturbed by environmental signals. You can have mutations, for sure, accumulating in the germline, but that's a pretty rare event. So what about this other type of inheritance that you may know something about, that you may have heard of, uh, epigenetic inheritance? What is it? How does it affect the health of my kids and your health? And is it important for our field of environmental toxicology? Well, epigenetics, simply put, is a layer of instructions that controls which genes within DNA are expressed. So it's not the DNA sequence itself, it's molecular marks either on top of or associated with the DNA that control which genes are on or off. And two really critical characteristics of these epigenetic marks, which I'll come back to later in the talk, are one, that they are responsive to environmental signals. So they can come on and off the DNA in response to stressors like, say, like, um, say contaminants. The other one is that they're heritable. So as cells divide, they tend to be maintained. What this implies is a different type of inheritance where my son's biology is not only affected by their genetics, but also by experience of the, experiences of their ancestors. So for example, uh, this is great-grandfather Basu. So he was born in India in 1914, and he worked on the India Railroad on steam engines. And so we can assume that he probably had pretty high levels of exposure to a lot of contaminants. Uh, but maybe particularly pH is from inhaling the, the coal smoke from, from these steam engines. So what epigenetic transgenerational inheritance implies is that those exposures that he experienced in his lifetime can be passed down through generations, through epigenetic marks in, this, in the germline, and be measurable in my kids and also affect their health. So with this transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, the idea is that they can be affected by things they weren't directly exposed to, that their ancestors were exposed to. Another type of uh, epigenetic inheritance occurs within our own lifetimes, and I'll call this developmental origins. So here I have a picture of myself, pregnant with my older son. And this illustrates a time in his life when he uh, was very sensitive to environmental contaminants and also when his epigenome was sensitive to these exposures. So the idea here is that early life exposures can leave these marks on our DNA which affect our health throughout our lives. So persistent or even latent effects. For this one, um, I'll use an example of my grandmother for a sort of more specific example. So this is uh, Ursula Herbst, she's my grandma, and she was born in 1922 in Germany. Her family was Jewish, so you can imagine she experienced a lot of stress in her life. Um, but interestingly, the episode that she always talked about uh, as an adult happened well before the war when she was five years old. And uh, she contracted uh, chronic tonsillitis at a time when there's no antibiotics. So they sent her off to the Swiss Alps to recover, and she had no contact with her family, with her parents or her sister with whom she was very close. And she was traumatized by this to the point when her parents came to pick her up, once um, she, she was better, uh, she didn't even recognize them. So she always felt through her whole life that this episode had marked her in some way and really affected for her whole adult life her mental health and also her, responsive, her responses to stressful events later in her life. 
What epigenetics suggests is that these marks are not just metaphorical. They're molecular marks on DNA that can determine, to determine our health. So today, what I'd like to talk about is some epigenetic mysteries. Um, so first of all, these are completely hypothetical examples I gave you based on my family. Are they realistic? Are they real? Uh, is there data? Are there data to, to back them up? And even if they're real, are they common? Are they, they the types of effects that we're actually going to, to detect or to, that are important in, in real natural environments? Secondly, what's the mechanism? How are these things transmitted? It's not through the DNA by definition, so how, how, is, how are these epigenetic uh, effects passed on? And then finally, is it important for environmental toxicology? Should it be important to you, to me, to your research? I'm actually going to start with the mechanisms and I'm, I'm going to spend some time on this because I think it's really important to understand what epigenetics is and what it isn't before we even try to address the other questions. Um, and then I'll give you some examples, like real examples, not just based on my family tree uh, from the literature. And then finally close with a, a few thoughts about whether I think it's important, but I'd encourage you to think throughout the talk about your own research and whether you think these mechanisms are important to you. Okay, so starting with the mechanisms, uh, I think I've said epigenetic marks like 20 times already in the past uh, seven minutes. So what are these epigenetic marks? Um, I really like this diagram, first of all, because it, it, uh, it shows that there could be positive or negative marks, like this pizza, cigarettes, apples, but clearly those are not what the epigenetic marks are. Uh, the prototypical epigenetic mark is simply a methyl group, a carbon with three hydrogens, and this attaches to DNA. Of course, it's not that simple. There's a whole host of other proteins transcriptions, factors, uh, enzymes that are involved in epigenetics. There's all these enzymes that uh, put the, the methyl marks onto the DNA or take them off, TETs, DNMTs. Uh, there's modifications not only of DNA but of histones, the proteins that DNA wraps uh, itself around. And there's this whole set of marks associated with them. There's chromatin structure, which is hugely important. So that's, that's the structure of the chromosome, chromosomes in the cell. Are they tightly packed so that you can't get any transcription? Or are they in a more open conformation that's permissive for transcription? There's one carbon metabolism that feeds the methyl groups into this process. And then there's non-coding RNA. So there's this whole machinery around epigenetics. Um, but uh, we'll just, for today, focus on methyl groups as the prototypical and maybe sort of simplest to understand. So what is DNA methylation? It's simply the addition of a methyl group to really any residue, but primarily cytosine residues within DNA. So DNA, four nucleotides, A, C, T, and G, cytosine's the C. And anywhere where you have a C followed by a G, that's a likely site for a cytosine uh, to be methylated. So we call this CPG methylation because it occurs in this CG context. What does it do? It uh, turns down gene expression. So here we have a gene, and then upstream of the gene is, gene is a regulatory region. So it's a promoter, and that's uh, the area that proteins will come in to transcribe the gene, so to turn it on. Uh, at the top here, we have an unmethylated region of CPG sites, so shown with these open lollipops. And so you get gene expression if transcription factors come to turn that gene on. In the bottom, we have a methylated um, CPG sites, a, a series of methylated CPG sites, and this has the effect of turning down or turning off gene expression. So that's what DNA methylation does. But you know, what does it really do? What does it, what, what does it look like in, in a cell or in an organism? Well, I have an extreme example of that to start with. Uh, these two mice are very different looking. Uh, the one on the left is yellow, obese, and also prone to diseases like diabetes, whereas the one on the left is brown and thin. But my, what might surprise you is that these are genetically identical siblings. So they come from an inbred mouse strain uh, you can think of them really like identical twins. The difference between them is methylation of a certain gene, the agouti gene. So the yellow mouse has an unmethylated 
uh, regulatory region upstream of the agouti gene, and it has the effect of turning the agouti gene on constitutively, so it's like always on, which is inappropriate, and that's why you get this yellow, fat, diseased mouse. Um, and the brown, in, the, in the brown mouse, this region is methylated, and so the agouti gene is e expressed for a very short stage of development, but not constitutively. This is a, an extreme example. So it's kind of analogous, you could say, to like a rare genetic mutation that would be predictive of some disease. Um, but there's, of course, a more constitutive role for DNA methylation in the cell. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, first, I just wanted to remind you of this definition, of my definition of epigenetics, and especially these two characteristics that I think when you put them together, that's what makes uh, the outcomes of these, these epigenetic effects a little unusual or something we're not used to. So the first is that they're responsive to environmental signals, and the second is that these epigenetic marks are heritable. I'll just take a minute to describe a little more closely what I mean by heritable. So if uh, you take this cell uh, and say it's, a, say it's a hepatocyte, a liver cell, in the nucleus are going to be all the genes in the genome, right? Those are present in every cell type, so 20,000 genes. What makes it a liver cell and not another cell type, like say a, a neuronal cell, is which genes are expressed, which genes are on. What the epigenetic marks do is they turn off, or they, they help to regulate huge um, areas, uh, regions of the genome. So maybe 10,000 genes are on in this liver cell, and the other 10,000 will be silenced through epigenetic marks. So then when this liver cell divides uh, to two daughter cells, those epigenetic marks are faithfully copied and appear in the daughter cell. So that's what we mean by heritable. Mitotically heritable as cells divide, the marks are retained. Um, and if that occurs in the, in the germline, that's when you get transgenerational effects. So then if you have an environmental stressor, like a contaminant, that comes along and affects this cell, it can change the epigenetic marks. And then those changes are gonna be copied. And so this is how you can have an effect, uh, an exposure at one time point, and then sort of the memory of that exposure um, maintained in the cells and an effect at a later time point when the, the initial exposure is done, it's no longer there. This exposure, if it happens at key periods of development, is more likely to have an effect. So for example, um, if we think about the developmental origins of these epigenetic effects, uh, if you get an exposure any time in this period, so any time from fertilization through the blastocyst, the embryo, and even into a young, young individual, juvenile, uh, there's more of a chance that those uh, effects will take hold and, and persist throughout the whole lifetime of the individual. And that's because there's a reprogramming event. So here, when the embryo is a blastocyst, it's an undifferentiated ball of cells. Those cells can become any different tissue type. At that point, DNA methylation is zero. And then those marks are reestablished in a tissue-specific manner over, over through development. So when the marks are being established, it makes sense if you have a change to those marks, then they're going to be, uh, have, a, have a large impact on the, on the adult organism. The other time period that's really crucial relates to transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So there you need to have an effect on the germline. So it's the period of sensitivity here starts uh, in embryonic development when the primordial germ cells are being formed. So these little green cells here, those are the cells that will become the mature egg and sperm in the adult. And there's another reprogramming event there in most species where the methyl marks are erased and then reestablished in a way that's appropriate for a sperm or an egg. And so anytime you get an exposure during this period when the sperm are even maturing, that has the potential to uh, transmit through the germline. Okay, so now uh, that's it for mechanisms. <laughs> what I'd like to do is go back to this family tree. And if you're sick of my family, that's fine. I won't be offended. You can uh, imagine your own ancestral exposures. Um, or better yet, you can think about this in terms of whatever organisms you study or whatever scientific questions uh, you're working on.
Um, but I'll start with an example that maps nicely to this transgenerational example that I gave you from my, my kids' ancestors. So the, the first real evidence um, that caught a lot of attention for these transgenerational epigenetic inheritance came from Michael Skinner's lab in, in 2005. What they did was they exposed a pregnant female rat to the fungicide vinclozolin, which is an antiandrogen. So they took the male offspring of this female rat and they mated the male with a control female and that produced the F2 generation. They took the males from the F2, mated them with another control female to produce the F3 generation. So this is like my kids, right, and their great grandpa up here. In this case, a female, but similar idea. What they saw was that in this, these F3 generation males, they had reproductive abnormalities. So subfertility, uh, for example, decrease in, in sperm motility. And, you know, that was in 2005. They've done a lot of work in this model since then, and they've linked some of these changes to changes in DNA methylation, uh, histone retention in the sperm, which is another epigenetic mark, and, uh, and non-coding RNAs. Now, you might have noticed that I'm talking about F3 only, not F2 and F1. They saw actually effects in F2 and F1 as well. But what's special about this F3 individual is that he is the first unexposed individual in this model. So if you look at the, the mother, the, the pregnant female rat that was initially exposed, obviously she's exposed. Also her embryo is exposed, that's this guy, the F1 male. And then the germ cells in the embryo are also exposed. So the, that, they become the sperm that becomes the F2 male. So he's exposed in a way too. So F3 in this model is the first truly transgenerational um, uh, generation where uh, you know, he wasn't exposed at all to the vinclozolin and yet these, these uh, effects are observed. So when this study first came out, it was pretty controversial and there's like a few reasons for that. One is that, um, well it relates back to something I said earlier that if you're really paying attention you might have caught on and that's that at two times during development the methyl marks are completely erased and then reestablished. So people thought, well, how can you have this transgenerational inheritance if you erase all of those marks? Since then, we're, and we're starting to understand this more and more, we realize that certain areas of the genome escape this reprogramming. So it doesn't happen universally across the genome. Another criticism, which I think will, you know, hit well in this room, is that the dose of vinclozolin they used was really, really high. So it's much higher than environmentally relevant, um, and it's also a lot higher than the lowest observable effect level for other, uh, other endpoints. So in that sense, it's maybe not that real relevant to, to risk assessment if these effects only occur at an extremely high level. But since then, and we saw a lot of evidence for this in the epigenetics session that just ended this afternoon, uh, a lot of different labs and many people in this room uh, have shown that these transgenerational effects happen in a variety of organisms. So I won't get into all the details in the interest of time, but in C. elegans, zebrafish, uh, Japanese quail, also other organisms like medaca, um, people are using oysters for, for this type of work, uh, the, these transgenerational effects have been uh, demonstrated and, and often at uh, environmentally relevant levels, sometimes linked to epigenetics and other times not. Um, what I do want to point out with this slide, though, is that, uh, you know, we have a variety of model organisms shown here. We know very little about the epigenomes of these organisms. What we do know suggests that they're quite different from mammals, where most of the work has been done. So, for example, C. elegans, uh, they don't even have DNA methylation, so that's very different. Um, the recent study showed that uh, a, a stressor of temperature that the, the epigenetic effects were transmitted through histones. Um, for zebrafish, their reprogramming is different, so they uh, don't have the erasure of, uh, of these DNA methylation marks in the male line, for example. And then in quail, uh, birds we really don't know very much, but uh, we do know, or we think anyway, 
that there's no genomic imprinting in birds. And I didn't mention that, but that's like one of uh, the ways that certain areas of the genome can escape reprogramming. So there's a lot of differences. I think a lot of opportunities for us that work with these different models to explore these epigenetic uh, phenotypes. The other thing that I'd like to point out about these transgenerational uh, epigenetic inheritance and, you know, its relevance uh, to environmental risk assessment relates to the study design of the, all of these studies. Uh, they're all lab studies. And what they've, they all have in common is they expose one or sometimes multiple generations, and then the subsequent generations are not exposed at all. And, you know, in an extreme situation, this is possible, but in general, it's not very realistic since we're all exposed to a huge mixture of contaminants at all times. So, for example, if I go back to the tree, you know, uh, my kid's great-grandfather, he was exposed to a lot of air pollution for sure, and particularly from the coal trains, per perhaps. But his son also spent 20 years of his life in India, exposed a lot of air pollution, so he's not completely unexposed. And then my kids, I mean, they're not completely clean either. So I think it will be really interesting, and, you know, in the next decades, as we take these, these models from the lab and bring them into the field and see how these, uh, these effects perform under more realistic exposure scenarios or, or multiple stressor type scenarios. The other thing that I really like to think about is that my kids don't just have one great-grandfather, right? They have eight great-grandparents, and each of them has their own story, their own history of exposure to environmental stressors. Um, also, they have grandparents and parents, and so at every generation, uh, there's the opportunity for these marks to be reversed. You know, they're plastic. They're, they're, uh, they can come on and off the DNA. So, all this to say that, you know, to my mind, the, the transgenerational effects are maybe not quite ready for risk assessment, um, but it will be very interesting to see how, how these um, effects behave once we look at them in more natural systems. What I think is a little more ready, maybe, for, you know, in our field of risk assessment is the developmental origins, the within lifetime effects. Um, so for that, I'm going to start by uh, showing an example that very closely mimics the story that I told you about uh, my grandmother. So this study was uh, done in 2005, or published in 2005, it's actually two professors from McGill, the university that I work at. It's a really neat study where they looked at uh, the behavior of rats. Um, they had two, two groups of rats in their lab. One were attentive mothers. So to be an attentive mother, a good mother, if you're a rat, all you have to do is a lot of arched back nursing, whatever that is, and uh, you have to lick, groom your pups frequently. So that makes you a good mother. And then they had this other group which were inattentive mothers. When they looked at the brains of the offspring, um, they saw that the, the, the offspring of the attentive mothers, they were pretty chill, they weren't very stressed, and they had uh, rarely methylated genes involved in the stress response. The, their genes involved in stress response, the glucocorticoid receptor was rarely methylated. The offspring of the inattentive mothers, they were very stressed, and they had these highly methylated genes involved in the stress response. So this could be genetic, obviously. That, that'd be kind of the first thing that might occur to you. So the researchers did a cross-fostering experiment where they took the pups from the inattentive mother and gave them to the attentive mother to raise, and vice versa. And what they found was that this phenotype of being less stressed and having rarely methylated genes, it went with the behavior of the mother and not with the genetics. So I, I find this study fascinating and really stunning that, you know, the mother's behavior, grooming, licking her pups, left molecular marks on their DNA that affected their personalities throughout their lives. So for my last example, um, of uh, developmental origins and epigenetic effects. I'll turn to my own research now. Uh, in my lab, we're interested in early life exposure to environmental contaminants in fish and birds. 
We study mostly lipophilic contaminants, so they're found in quite high concentrations in bird eggs, for example, these herring gull eggs. And the questions we're asking relate to the environment that the embryonic bird experiences as it's developing. So these birds will develop in an environment, a you know, closed environment of the egg that's chock full of a whole mixture of contaminants. What we're interested in is how these contaminants affect their development, uh, but also how does it affect their health later in life, and then how does the, the, the environment that they developed in, how does it affect their responses to the same contaminants or different contaminants later in life, and does this occur through epigenetic mechanisms? So the idea here uh, relates to the predictive adaptive response, and that is that if the idea being that if you, uh, if, if the environment that you hatch into matches your embryonic environment, well then that will be adaptive. Whereas if there's a mismatch, uh, then that could be detrimental to your health. So we're exploring this in a chicken model. We use chicken eggs. And we use uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, um, particularly in this experiment, benzo k BKF, which is one of the most potent uh, PAHs in birds. You'll see in a minute, I think, why we, we think pHs are a good test compound to, to answer these questions. And uh, we're, we're looking at, in terms of effects, we're looking at induction of phase one biotransformation enzymes, so in this case, CYP1A. So the experiment is to inject uh, BKF into an uh, unincubated but fertilized chicken egg. The concentration of BKF we used for this experiment is 100 micrograms per kilogram. That's environmentally relevant-ish, like not really environmentally relevant, but close. Uh, so it's, it's quite a bit, an order of magnitude higher than what you would find for that, that chemical in an egg. But if you think about all the pHs, the some pHs in a really contaminated site, then it's getting close. It did, it did cause some mortality though, so it is a high dose. So we expose them in the egg, and then we take their livers at embryonic day 19, that's two days prior to hatch, and we slice up the livers, we put them in a 48-well plate, and we re-expose them to the same or different contaminant in vitro, in culture. This is a nice uh, model because we can, you know, take many slices from one individual and expose them to many different things or many different concentrations. Okay, so why BKF? Why, is, why are pHs a good model for the questions we're asking? Well, because previous research has shown that uh, BKF is, uh, is metabolized by the embryo, and by the time it gets to embryonic day 19, the BKF should be gone. There's no more BKF. And so this gives us an opportunity to do a first exposure and then a re-exposure in the absence of the initial stressor to test the hypothesis about whether epigenetic effects are involved. So the first thing we did was just look at the expression across development. So we inject on day zero, and then at embryonic day seven, we take the liver, and it's just a tiny, tiny little liver, not mature yet. It's not expressing the, the phase one biotransformation enzyme yet. On embryonic day 10, we get a nice, healthy induction of the CYP1A enzyme. Uh, well, this is measured as gene expression, but the enzyme would also be induced. This enzyme then does its job. It metabolizes the BKF. And so by embryonic day 19, the BKF is metabolized and you don't have that induction anymore. So it's a transient response. So then just to remind you, we did a second exposure in vitro, right? So we have control and BKF treated eggs and then a re-exposure to BKF in the cultured cells. So what I'm showing you here is uh, the BKF in the cultured cells across the x-axis and, and the dose response curve that results from a control embryo, so an embryo that was just injected with the vehicle. When we do this with uh, embryos that were pre-injected with BKF, we see an additional response. So they're more sensitive to, to induction. Our next step was to try and see if we can uh, find a, an epigenetic marker that correlates with this response. So first uh, thing we did was look at methylation 
of the CYP1A promoter. And we did see uh, an increase in methylation in the CYP1A promoter across six different CPG sites. Uh, and this was not significant until embryonic day 19 and day 2 uh, in, in the embryo. So just to remind you that the increase in gene expression was seen at embryonic day 10. So that was transient. And then this epigenetic marker is more persistent. Right? Um, so that sort of went with our hypothesis, but we don't think that DNA methylation is what's causing the phenotype that we see. There's a couple of reasons. One is that the overall methylation in the promoter is pretty low, so it's, it's pretty permissive to transcription already. The other is the increase in methylation is really small. It could possibly have an effect, but generally people are looking at much larger increases to see a biological effect. Third reason is it's the wrong direction. Um, so there's a possibility there, too, that it could be causing increases in gene expression, but generally, as I explained, increase in methylation is associated with repression. So uh, the next thing we did, which I won't show the data, is we looked at expression of a whole bunch of other genes in the, in the same pathway, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, the, the repressor, and we didn't see the same phenotype where you get an increased induction because of pre-exposure in any of those other uh, genes. So now, and the current, the, these experiments are currently going on, we're looking at acetylation of histone, so a different epigenetic mark that some evidence from the, the uh, mammalian literature suggests might be important at this locus. Okay, so why are we doing this? Back out to sort of the more big, big picture. Why, why is this important? Why do I think it's exciting? One is, I, I think it would be really cool to find a biomarker in this system that's linked with a phenotype because then we can go into more realistic uh, exposure scenarios and take this um, to, to see how it would behave uh, in the real world. The other thing relates to variability. So if you catch a gull in the Great Lakes, you don't know what its background of history uh, to exposure is. You don't know if it was an egg on a contaminated colony or a clean colony. Um, but this could have a really important impact on its sensitivity. Um, and, you know, your correlational studies that you do might really be affected by its prior exposure to contaminants. So to have a biomarker that suggests what prior exposure was, that could be quite interesting. Uh, another thing that uh, might be interesting in this model or others is uh, if these epigenetic effects help organisms to adapt to, lo to, to local contamination. It could be an explanation of why some wildlife tend to do better in contaminated environments than we'd expect. You know, maybe they have uh, exposure during embryonic development that helps them to, to deal with that situation, and that's not what we do in the lab when we do toxicity testing. Um, that point sort of uh, feeds into my final point about this system, which, you know, I, I called this a rough start in life question mark, because I think a lot of these epigenetic marks um, and the examples I've been talking about, we're thinking about the change in the epigenetics being associated with a negative outcome or a disease. But in this example, maybe it's adaptive. Maybe a little bit of contamination as you're developing uh, in the egg will help you deal with that contaminant when you hatch and you'll certainly encounter it again. Okay, so back to these original questions. Is epigenetic inheritance real? Yeah, I think we've established it's real, and transgenerational inheritance is also real. But a lot of it, this work is being done in lab models. So how this applies to the real world, how common it is in the real world, and how important it is for risk assessment, I really think the jury's out on that one, particularly for transgenerational inheritance. Could be hugely important, we just don't really know yet. In terms of the mechanisms, um, you know, this is the biomedical world is working very hard on this and we're starting to understand more and more uh, how epigenetic inheritance occurs, but there's certainly a lot more work to be done in that area and very little is known outside of the typical rodent models. Uh, finally, is epigenetics important to you? Well, I don't know. Um, is it important to sea tackers in general or environmental toxicologists? This is my opinion. Um, first answer is, of course it is. It's a fundamental mechanism that describes biological responses to environmental stressors to contaminants. So no, it's not you know, just a buzzword that will help you get grants. 
it is uh, really important to, to, to the, these relationships that we're all studying and trying to, to describe. Is epigenetics important to seed deckers? Yes, uh, it describes variation. It adds like a whole other level of variation on top of genetic or environmentally induced uh, variation. And I feel like we, as a society, we know about variation. If, uh, for those of you who are field biologists, you know, you go out into the field and you measure all these interesting biological effects, go back the next year, pretty sure you're not going to find the same ones. And, you know, that's not all due to epigenetics, obviously, but this is one explanation that can ex explain some of that variability. Third answer is maybe. So epigenetic biomarkers would be great. They could give us clues to ancestral exposures and maybe even be helpful for looking at some of these transgenerational effects. I think the jury's still out on how this is gonna pan out and how important or common this is in natural environments, but there's definitely work to be done in that area. And then finally, um, I think that our field, ecotoxicology, has a lot to offer the field of epigenetics. I didn't uh, present any data on human epidemiological studies, but there's a huge literature looking at these effects, mostly developmental origins in humans. Of course, uh, with epidemiological or human studies, you don't have as many opportunities to do different types uh, of experiments. And uh, I think that exploring this in non-human models, uh, in, in all types of this, the, the diversity of species that we all, all work with, could be very interesting and contribute to the field at large, not just to, to environmental talks. So I would like to, before closing, just suggest if people are really interested in this, some further reading. There's a, a focus article that I wrote for our journal, our society's journal, Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, about epigenetics, called Epigenetics for Ecotoxicologists. And more recently, uh, Susan Brander and colleagues um, published an um, um, update on this, in a sense, uh, and it's more specifically towards aquatic toxicology, but both of these are written in very accessible language, so if you're interested, uh, you can read those. And then this review I found quite interesting, which uh, is a recent review relating to epigenetics and risk assessment frameworks. So I'm going to uh, tweet out these references in case anyone's interested. I think I have 11 Twitter followers currently. So. <laughs> So I'm thinking maybe after this I'll have more, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so with that, I'd really like to thank you for attending uh, um, and, and thank you for your attention. And I'd be really happy to talk to anyone uh, about this topic. I'm also looking, this is a shameless plug, I'm looking for a grad student to work on the project I described to start in September. So please email me if you have some molecular interest and care about the environment and are interested in working in my lab, I'd love to hear from you. And finally, uh, I'll be here all week, and a good place to find me is at the Ecotox lab, or sorry, that's my lab, uh, the Ecotox chip booth. We have a, this is a project relating uh, toxicogenomics to regulatory risk assessment, and uh, we have a booth, so if you're looking for me, I'm likely to be there quite a bit, and I would really like uh, to, to chat with some people about this or other topics. So with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. <laughs>